I really want to thank Ugo for keeping this long tradition with these meetings, even under these difficult times. But I hope next time we can meet in person as well. So, and also Ugo invited me to write a chapter in a, uh, in a about neuromuscular disorders diagnostics. And this is what I will start talking about as well. It's about um, how we can differentiate been acquired neuro neurogenic versus uh, myopathic uh, quadriplegia in intensive care unit patients. And if, as we all know, muscle wasting is accompanied by a number of different conditions and critical illness is one of them. And I think though, if we want to go for efficient therapies, it's not only about blowing up muscle in size, we should also target underlying mechanism. And, uh, and unfortunately, when it comes to critical illness, uh, muscle wasting, that has not been the case in the past. And there's a long tradition about um, misdiagnosis on these patients. And, uh, but there was a, a recent review uh, by Lad and, and co-workers when they talked about uh, the muscle wasting and muscle weak, waste, weakness in intensive care unit is not just another muscle atrophy condition. It's actually a specific muscle disease, uh, typically called critical illness myopathy. But I also want to highlight this for some reason, these patients have been lumped under the diagnosis intensive care unit acquired weakness. And for me, that this is really a red flag, I think, because traditionally these patients have been diagnosed as a critical illness polyneuropathy based on misinterpretation of electrophysiological signals. And I will come back to this really. And over time, it's become more and more evident that the majority of these patients are actually suffering from a specific myopathy, this critical illness myopathy. And gradually over decades, uh, it's been a very slow shift uh, from neglecting this initially, then partially lumping the myopathies together with the neuropathy called a combined critical illness neuro neuropathy and myopathy. And people seem to be very pleased with just lumping them together under this diagnosis, the intensive care unit acquired weakness. And I think this is, uh, every patient dis deserves as correct diagnosis as possible. And eventually if we want to go for uh, specific therapies, we'd need to go for underlying mechanisms. And they're definitely different in the acquired neuropathy, which exists, but it's, which is quite rare compared to the specific myopathy. And as we all know, uh, Universal hospitals, uh, hospital beds are decreasing, but ICU beds are increasing dramatically. And of course, this has become very apparent in the current pandemic uh, when we are uh, stressing our ICU capacities all over the world right now. And uh, with this pandemic also comes acquired muscle paralysis. And it's not the new entity. It has been there together with critical care for a long time but it's becoming more apparent now. Before, maybe we saw one patient a week, but during the pandemic in the spring, it was more than 10 patients a day sometimes, really. And it's the same worldwide, I would say. But it's still ignored for the reason I don't understand, really. And this myopathy was described the first time in 1977 in, in a short case report by McFarlane and Rosenthal in The Lancet. A young woman with a status asthmaticus attack came to the emergency room and she was had to be transferred to the ICU and there she was hooked up to the ventilator to ensure uh, oxygenation of the central nervous system. And, uh, and at that time, neuromuscular blockers were used frequently. So she was pharmacologically paralyzed so she would not work against the ventilator. And she was also giving massive doses with steroids to fight the infection. And when infection was cured and they started weaning from the ventilator, it was noticed that she had intact cognitive function, intact sensory function, but she couldn't move any arms or legs. She was completely quadriplegic. But this was resolved eventually and she recovered relatively well, well but it took weeks or months. And these patients, as I said, have been misdiagnosed as a a polyneuropathy or specifically a, a motor axonopathy. And apologize me for these very simple um, uh, following slides, but I know 
Many of you are not familiar with the clinical neurophysiology, but I'll just show you briefly how we do measurements of motor, motor nerve conduction velocities and why these patients have been misdiagnosed in the past. And typically we do this with surface electrodes and we stimulate distally and we get this what we call the distal latency and we get the compound muscle action potential, which is sort of reflecting the number of motor units activated. And then we do more proximal stimulation and we got to get a similar response. And then by measuring the distances between the first and second stimulus and, uh, and the time difference, we can then measure uh, conduction velocity. And the size of the compound muscle action potential, we can say is a reflection of the, of the number of uh, functioning motor, motor axons. And this is a super maximum stimulation, which means we recruit all motor units. Yeah, so here we go. But when we have uh, axon loss, in this uh, case because of uh, traumatic lesion, when we stimulate distally, we get a response that is lower than normal, normal because we have fewer axons going to the muscle. We stimulate uh, proximally. We get the same uh, small response, but conduction velocity is normal. And this is then a reflection of what we call axonopathy, uh, uh, loss of motor axons. And then, uh, but you see, the thing is, the decrease in compound muscle action have other can be caused by other mechanisms as well. And what is happening critically in myopathy, you typically also have a less excitable muscle membrane. And this is the reason why these patients have been misdiagnosed as a motor axonopathy, but it's actually because the, the decreased size in the compound muscle action is a less excitable muscle membrane. And also when we do this electroneurography, we typically do it also together with a needle EMG, and we put a needle in the muscle. And if you have a, a muscle where you have motor axon loss, single muscle cells start to discharge spontaneously about three weeks after they have lost the uh, axon contact. And this is typically positive shock waves of fibrillation potentials, which we also call denervation activity. But we can also see this spontaneous activity when we have muscle membrane defect. So it's easy to put your foot in the trap here and call this a neuropathy. And that explains why these patients have also been misdiagnosed for so, so long time and still are being misdiagnosed. At the time when we were setting up uh, um, the skin fiber preparation to look on contractor properties in single human muscle cells, this was in early 90s, it's almost uh, uh, 30 years ago from now. George Carpotti was at the, a tour in our hospital and accidentally he came into my lab and he saw this um, setup where we can then measure force, contractor speed and look on contractor protein expression in this single cell muscle segments. And he said, he, he did something no one else had done before in these patients. He also took a muscle biopsy and did uh, electromicroscopy. And then he found the A band was missing in the muscle. There was no motor protein in the muscle. At least I did not forget about this. And I was on call Christmas in 1995. And I, a neurologist from another hospital had this strange patient uh, with a complete quadriplegia. But she, had, uh, she could communicate with facial expression since facial muscles were not uh, affected. She could not talk because she had the tracheostomy. And she had also intact uh, sensory function. She reacted to pain. And when I did the electrophysiology, it indicated motor axonopathy, sensory nerve conduction potentials were normal. And uh, what you can see here to the left, this is a single muscle cell from a, a healthy subject under relaxing maximum activating condition. And this is from the patient. And as you can see, something has, sorry, something has happened to these muscle cells and uh, the normal cross duration pattern is lost. And looking at single cells in humans, we have three myosin heavy chain isoforms, so slow and too fast. Single cells, we see no myosin. We load bundles of 10 to 20 fibers, and still we don't see any myosin. And we look in a different um, uh, gel system, a 12% gel. And one, two, and three are, are then uh, muscle sections from a patient with a hemiplegia due to a central lesion. lesion. On the paretic and the non paretic side, we see full expression of thick filament proteins, myosin and myosin associated proteins, 
but no thick filament protein uh, on the in the in the uh, intensive care unit patients, the thin filament proteins are expressed. So there's a preferential loss of myosin, which can also be confirmed if we look at the EM level. And this is just a control subject with the, uh, with the C line, C line, and here in the center, we have the A band. This is the patient, we have C lines, but no A band, motor protein loss. So then we have, tried to uh, evaluate different electrophysiological techniques to um, identify these patients. And a theoretically very interesting model was developed by Rich and co-workers in the US. When they compared the response from a, a nerve stimulation compared with direct muscle stimulation. So in principle, if you have a less excitable muscle membrane, you will get um, low compound muscle action potential, both with uh, nerve and muscle stimulation. And, uh, and the, the ratio between the two is more than 0.5. But if you have a primary neurogenic lesion, you should have a much lower response when you stimulate the, the nerve compared to the direct muscle stimulation. And this is in theory, very attractive. And we'll try to evaluate this then. But also another way of looking on, on the membrane excitability is to do at ref, refractoriness by doing a double stimulation. And this is the stimulation artifact with the first stimulation. And here comes the compound muscle action potential. And here comes the next stimulation and compound muscle action potential. And then you just reduce the interval between these uh, stimuli. And when an amplitude is for the second stimuli is decreased by more than 50%, that's when you call it, you have the refractory period then. This could then also be useful in the um, diagnosis of these patients. The problem is there's a large variability and these uh, examinations take a long time. If we want to do this right in an ICU patient, patient it typically takes more than two hours typically up to three hours per patient, which is not ideal in an environment when these patients are treated in, in the, for the intensive care of them. But anyway, so we have evaluated then these different methods in 144 uh, uh, ICU patients, where all were di uh, uh, diagnosed with muscle biopsies to look on the mice and actin ratio, and also all of them were exposed to conventional electrophysiology with the electromyography, needle electromyography, electroneurography, the locomotor and sensory nerve conduction velocities and amplitude responses. And first of all, during a refractory period, it, it was impossible because there was such a large number of late responses which made these uh, uh, investigations impossible to conduct, we thought, at least in a reliable way. But also we're taking muscle biopsies then by um, using this conventional uh, concretor method, which is a small intervention, but we take a piece about uh, 80 to 100 milligrams, and we just take a two 10 micron cross section, run them on the gel and look at the myosin content in relation to actin content then. And we wanted to uh, use a method of taking smaller samples. So we started using an aspiration biopsy technique used for cytology and cancer diagnostics. And we tested in, in a porcine models where pigs were ventilated for five days. We took open biopsies and used this uh, aspiration biopsy technique in two samples in a close vicinity to the open biopsy. And there was high reproducibility and high precision with this aspiration biopsy technique. But in clinical work, it didn't work though. We, we do it through the skin because often there was no muscle in the sample and there was mostly blood and connective tissue. So then we turned into this other disposable microneedle designed to, for uh, kidney biopsies. And instead we forget about 100 milligrams, we get around 10 milligrams or when we measure between four and 15 milligrams. But the reliability and the, I mean, it's almost line of identity when we compare the concretome with these uh, uh, disposable needle biopsies. And the advantage, of course, is the disposable instrument we throw away after each uh, patient. And it's a much less intervention. I would say the trauma with this needle biopsy is even less than a conventional needle EMG examination. And it can be repeated multiple times as well for monitoring purposes. 
So then when we compare then, uh, we look at uh, what we call is the hallmark of a critical illness myopathy, the preferential myosin loss, and we've divided them into different brackets then. When we have a severe myosin loss, the myosin actin ratio is less than 0.5. Uh, moderate, mildly moderate, mild, and normal when the mice and reactor ratio is 1.7 or higher. And that should be twice as much mice and as actin. So the normal ratio is typically around two. So when we then compare, um, uh, because enzyme histochemistry has also been used as um, for diagnosing these patients by looking at the blurring of the enzyme histochemical stem from my fibro ATPs or use, using. Um, uh, monoclonal antibodies for myosin, but actually the diagnostic precision is very low uh, with enzyme histochemistry. So open by, uh, bars here, uh, sorry, uh, indicates no critical illness myopathy, and we have with the enzyme histochemistry, we have some diagnosed as no critical illness myopathy, but they have a myosin actin ratio below 0.5, and it goes the other way as well. So. Enzyme histochemistry is of very little value uh, in the diagno for diagnosing these patients with critical lens myopathy. And the interesting thing, some of these patients were diagnosed as a critical illness polyneuropathy based on type grouping and grouped atrophy in muscle biopsies. But on the other hand, type grouping and group atrophy, it takes a long time to develop, probably more than six months at least. And it's not the cause of uh, the increase in um, I mean, the acute quadriplegia we see in these patients. And it also tells us something that many of these patients, when they are admitted to the ICU, they have a clinical history, including neuropathies. And the same thing when we use uh, compared direct versus indirect stimulation, it also has a relatively low precision in diagnosing or separating or diagnosing critical illness myopathy, but what it has a high precision though, and that is in identifying the critical illness polyneuropathy, which means you have a low amplitude response when you stimulate the motor nerve, and you get a higher amplitude response when you stimulate the muscle. But this is a rare condition compared with the critical illness myopathy. And this is just showing that the, we, the, the correlation here is quite low. And when you do a scatter plot, as you can see, the variability is enormous. And the only uh, uh, Cor correlations that are significant is actually when you compare the compound muscle action potential upon direct muscle or indirect via the nerve, but the correlation is really weak and it's not uh, useful for uh, diagnostic purposes, at least not been separating my myopathies from neuropathies. And this is also shown in a group of neuro ICU, pa neuro -ICU patients, which we follow for 12 days on the ventilator. And in all these new ICU patients, 12 of them, uh, there is a progressive preferential myosin loss that starts uh, quite early. But if you look at the compound muscle action potentials to the left, when you stimulate the perineal nerve, the median nerve, or the tibial nerve, there's no effect here. So actually the, the decreased muscle membrane excitability is preceded by the myosin loss. And the interesting thing here, these are neuro ICU patients. Uh, and in this study, as well as in a previous study in nine neuro ICU patients followed uh, over about a two week period, all of them developed a critical illness myopathy. But in the general ICU population, we typically see about one third of the patients developing this critical illness myopathy. So what is the reason? Uh, and I'll come back to this and also when it comes to experimental model. I think it's the mode of mechanical ventilation, because in the newer ICU patients, we don't have a central drive for ven ventilation, and therefore it's completely controlled by the ventilator. But assisted ventilation is preferred in the ICUs when, you, when the ventilator follows the respiratory drive. And the reason for this, is you get less ventilator-induced lung injury. And I'll come back to this as I think an important factor triggering this condition. So in conclusion, if we compare then the, um, uh, these electrophysiological methods, I think the conventional electrophysiology can be useful in detecting a peripheral origin of an acquired quadriplegia in ICU patients. And it, this is, can be important from separating from uh, a central cause of, the, of this quadriplegia.
And this comparing the direct versus indirect muscle stimulation and refractoriness uh, or the in theory very attractive, but not in practice, unfortunately. And also the small amount of muscle tissue that we get with these disposable micro biopsy instruments is sufficient for uh, detecting this preferential mice loss. And it's also enough to do RNA sequen sequencing and proteomics really, and it can be repeated on multi multiple times then. And also, of course, it's much less invasive, although uh, percutaneous biopsies is not an invasive uh, intervention, but still though, you have to make a skin incision about one centimeter and get it in, and then dissect yourself down to the muscle and take out the samples. With the microbiopsy, it's a one millimeter skin incision and then just take out the samples. It's, uh, it's quite important that it's less traumatic uh, since these patients are typically also on heavy uh, anticoagulantia treatment then. So that sort of <clears throat> wraps up a little bit this with the intervention uh, studies, uh, sort of these diagnostic methods. And our research on these ICU patients sort of stands on three different legs. Mechanisms, which I have presented in previous presentations that is part of our meetings. Diagnostics and monitoring, which we talked about today then. But also intervention studies that I would like to discuss with you, ongoing interventions in these ICU patients. And for this purpose, we are using primarily an experimental ICU model. It's a model where rats are pharmacologically paralyzed, mechanically ventilated, and monitored 24 hours per day. And to the right, you can see what we are monitoring these rats. Uh, this is the uh, PCO content uh, in the expiratory gas. We monitor EEG to make sure that these rats are fully dated, fully sedated with isoflurane. We measure the pressure for each breath, the ECG, intra-arterial blood pressure, intravenous blood pressure, blood, blood tem body temperature, and also not seen on this screen is the peripheral perfusion and peripheral oxygen saturation then. So we have a good model and we have a ventilating system which is not limited by early mortality. And actually the longest duration a rat has been mechanically ventilated and monitored like this in this setup is 96 days, uh, which is a record we're not trying to break, but typically we go up to 10 days and that's more than enough to uh, induce this critical illness, illness myopathy, as well as uh, this ventilator induced diaphragm muscle dysfunction. Commercial available ventilators can typically not maintain life support more than a day or two in these rats. And that is adding a significant confounding factor, especially since some of these conditions take five days or longer to uh, develop. So what are then the factors triggering um, critical illness myopathy? Initially it was said to be a neuromuscular blockade. It's something that is rarely used nowadays, sepsis or high doses of corticosteroids. But actually we see ICU patients with none of these three interventions that develop critical lens myopathy. And we can induce this in the, in the rat model without any of these interventions as well. But what all ICU patients have in common that develop the critical lens myopathy is long-term mechanical ventilation. And also what we call complete mechanical silencing. And what we mean with complete mechanical silencing in limb muscles at least, no weight bearing and no internal strain related to activation of contractor proteins. Uh, sort of taking away all the mechanosensitive uh, pathways in, in stimulating protein synthesis and degradation. But also mechanical ventilation per se induces a lung injury and release of factors with systemic effects. And this is particular so in, in patients and animals exposed to controlled mechanical ventilation why this ventilation mode is also avoided as much as possible, but has to be used when there is no central drive. And is also frequently used in COVID-19 patients, especially if they're ventilated in the prone position. So our current hypothesis actually is that the, the most important factor triggering uh, this critical illness myopathy it's a ventilator-induced lung injury and release of factors that have systemic effects, so to say. And it's not only muscle that is affected by uh, this uh, release of factors. It has also a strong impact on bone. And this is just showing uh, femoral bone 
and loss of trabecular bone volume, and, uh, and which also results in decreased uh, strength of the bone and increased fracture risk. And of course, this is very cl clinically relevant because after ICU discharge and after hospital discharge, these patients are leaving hospital with weak bones and weak muscles, both very important for predicting the risk of falls and fractures, and especially in the elderly, of course. So what we are, our current focus now in these uh, ICU patients, as well as in the um, experimental models is to test different interventions. And I will list some of them that we have invest, uh, that we have looked at. Mechanical loading, passive mechanical loading, electrical stimulation where we have implanted electrodes um, in the soleus muscle, and then uh, using the uh, stimulation padding scheme introduced by Terry Lerma many years ago, but also different types of pharmacological interventions. Uh, where we focus on in interest initially, I will tell you a little bit about this, is the chaperone co-inducer BGP-15. And the reason why we went for this intervention is in our initial poor sign ICU models, we found that when function was com compromised, uh, these uh, heat shock proteins were typically downregulated, and we thought maybe if we can induce these heat shock proteins by this uh, by specific uh, chaperone co-inducer, we may have a positive effect. And as I said before, uh, steroid corticosteroids have been uh, forward as um, factor triggering critical illness myopathy. I think this is changing now, and actually the anti-inflammatory effect is actually beneficial. Of course, if you give massive doses to patients with, uh, uh, with corticosteroids, you also get these harsh negative effects uh, with protein degradation, of course. So that is like gasoline on fire. But there is also this uh, analog Vamrolone developed by uh, Eric Hoffman as a drug. It's a prednisone-like drug, but without the harsh Hormonal, negative hormonal effects, and actually a drug developed primarily for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it has beneficial effects as well. And also what we have been focusing on now most recently is like the JAK-STAT inhibitors. And of course, uh, and this feeds into the cytokine activation, the IL-6 and downstream effects on these uh, signaling pathways. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. Hypercapnia seems to have an uh, effect, but this is, these are preliminary results. We have tested uh, human bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells. Uh, which are, the idea then that is that when we inject these cells, these stem cell like cells, they will stick in the lung and have the uh, anti inflammatory effect. Unfortunately, what we found here with these human cells is that we have also had adverse effects. Some rats survived up to eight days, but many of them died three days with the blood pressure fall and cardiac arrhythmia, and we interpret that as an effect or rejection effect to these human cells in the rat. So what we're testing now is that it's actually microvesicles from these um, cells. And here we, these are ongoing studies, but they're so far very promising. And, uh, and this hope we can be back at least in May with more uh, details about these results. But I just quickly presenting these results with this uh, pharmacological intervention with the chaperone co-inducer BGP-15, a small protein that has many different effects. It's uh, membrane stabilizers, protects mitochondria. And I didn't mention this, but actually mitochondria is a key player in the pathophysiology of critical illness myopathy, as well as um, in uh, the diaphragm and the ventilator-induced diaphragm muscle dysfunction. But it is also a membrane stabilizer, it's anti-inflammatory, has many unknown uh, mechanisms. The good thing though, it has no known uh, side effects. And it was initially designed as an insulin sensitizer that has been in clinical trials for this in the US previously. <clears throat> so we gave this BGP-15 systemically to the rats, and this is just looking at the diaphragm then. <clears throat> so when we look uh, to the left uh, cross-sectional area and diaphragm muscle cells, they drop quite rapidly in size and after 10 days. And then with BGP-15, we see no real effect uh, on uh, muscle fiber size, but we see a dramatic increase in force generating capacity. So uh, just uh, what I should like to mention here as well, if you combine the effect with the uh, diaphragm muscle atrophy, 
and the loss in specific force. The residual function after 10 days mechanical ventilation in the rat uh, in the diaphragm is less than 15% actually. So a, and this is the main reason for the slow weaning of the ventilator from these patients then. <clears throat> So what is the reason for the improvement in, uh, in diaphragm muscle cell force generating capacity? Then we have used our single fiber in vitro motility assay where we can extract myosin from single cells and then look on the uh, speed by, by which myosin can propel actin, but also using a more recent technique <clears throat> when we add an actin binding protein uh, to the actin filaments and look at the how many how many filaments are moving and how that changes with the increase in alpha kinin concentration, which gives us an indirect measure of the force generating capacity. <clears throat> and what we can sorry, and what we can see here, this is the, at the single cell level, force goes up, but it also goes up at the motor protein level. And in, in contrast to the uh, limb muscles uh, in these rats, uh, we don't have a preferential myosin loss in the diaphragm, but we have protein modifications impairing diaphragm muscle function. And it seems like uh, this BGP-15 protects uh, myosin from these modifications that are also hampering the function of the myosin molecule. Actually, we see the same thing in limb muscles as well, that uh, um, the, uh, I think we skipped to the next one. Uh, in the soleus muscle, uh, before we have a myosin loss, BGP-15 also improves uh, soleus muscle function. And uh, so I think actually in the, in, even in the limb muscles, we have post-translation modifications preceding the myosin loss. And these post-translation modifications are like in the diaphragm are coupled to this mitochondrial dysfunction. And a very surprising finding from these uh, studies. I mean, although we can maintain life support for long durations, we lose uh, rats during these experiments. Typically, we, there's a mucus plug that we not cannot remove fast enough, and we have a compromised respiratory function, we get cardiac arrhythmias, etc. But rats treated uh, with the BGP-15, we had zero mortality over a 10-day period on the mechanical ventilation, but it's almost 80% mortality without any intervention. And actually, we see a similar improved um, survival in rats uh, treated with the JAK-STAT inhibitor, indicating that this anti-inflammatory response in the cytokine, etc., are playing an important role in at least in the mortality. And the two factors that most strongly predict mortality in ICU patients is old age and muscle wasting, and they probably act synergistically. And this is, I just scanned through this quickly, but we have then compared uh, young and old Fisher Brown, Fisher 344 Brown Norway hybrid rats uh, in controls and those exposed to mechanical ventilation. And after mechanical ventilation, these rats are completely separate and they show a completely different uh, pattern in both at the uh, differentially expressed genes as well as in proteins, that in young animals is typically down-regulation of metabolic pathways, probably reflection of the inactivation of the muscles with the neuromuscular broker. But in the old animals, on the other hand, it's a dramatic upregulating of inflammatory pathways and cytokine expression. So, just this is just wrapping up the about this age related difference. So there's a differential expression of MRN transcripts and also proteins between young and old rats exposed to mechanical ventilation. Inactivity related primarily in the young, but in the old, it's primarily a, a dramatic increase in immune and inflammatory response. And this is, I think, is also clinically very relevant because in, in the current COVID-19 pandemic, we know that the, the high rate of mortality is particularly seen in old patients exposed to long-term mechanical ventilation. And this has been said to be related to the cytokine storm induced by the coronavirus, which may be a strong contributing factor, but actually this cytokine activation is also seen in response to the intervention in itself, the mechanical ventilation without a viral infection. Then. So this, with this, I'd like to conclude and of course, thank our funding sources and
our friend from Padova, Nicola Cacciani, our anesthesiologist in the lab for now almost 10 years, sends his greetings to all his friends in Padova. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lars, for this uh, wonderful lecture. I hope you will influence decision of the group uh, working on CAA, Center for Ag Active Aging, to extend uh, uh, the, the network. But this could be one of the topic of the sure. immediately starting brainstorming for, for CAA. Helmut, would you co-chair with me? Can I ask yes. you to so sure. a question sure yes yeah, so showing of that biopsy in which uh, all the myosin was lost you know and uh, can you tell me how long was this patient in intensive care mm -hmm. uh, the second question would be how do you correlate uh, your results with uh, the result a few years ago Bottinelli published uh, you know loss of myosin during bed resting something like that can I just ask you the, the questions quickly? Yeah. I think we we long time ago we did this uh, six uh, yeah, 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 weeks uh, uh, head down till bed rest, and then we don't see a preferential myosin loss. We see a general loss of both thick and thin film, sure, and then the duration when we see this uh, complete myosin loss. And actually, a complete myosin loss we don't see very often. But those patients have typically been on the ventilator at least for two or three weeks. And that is sort of the doctor's delay with that we have seen uh, typically as well. There's a doctor's delay from the referring physician and also from the neurophysiology lab. So typically about at least two or three weeks. But we see this when we do uh, uh, prospective studies in our new ICU patients, there's an early loss of myosin. When I say early, at least after four or five days, at least, let's say five days and longer. And that is what we see in the rat model as well. Rats that have been on the ventilator for, for, for five days and longer, then we see preferential myosin loss. But we don't go up longer than about two weeks. And then maybe we have more than 50% loss of myosin. Thank you. 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 Th